webinar will be a little bit over one hour. Um, with this, we'll, we'll start with Rebecca, and she's going to talk uh, about the uh, interaction between the Arctic Ocean and uh, the Pacific, North Pacific Ocean. Uh, please go ahead, Rebecca. Good morning, everybody. Can you see my slides? Does that work? Yes, can I get a thumbs up from someone? Anybody? That looks great. We can see it. Good. Can you see my slides? Yeah. yeah, okay, good, 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 and you can hear me. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Rebecca Woodgate from the University of Washington, and my co-author on this is Cecilia peralta Ferez, who is also somewhere on this call. Um, this work is funded by the US National Science Foundation, Office of Polar Programs, and is part of the Arctic Observing Network. The title really gives you the whole story. Um, we're talking about how things have changed in the Bering Strait. Um, and if you hang around, as I hope you will, that's why you came, you'll also learn, I hope, about these four things, why we care about the Bering Strait, recent change, how the Arctic is driving the Bering Strait through flow. I see my collaborator on that, Anne Nguyen, is also here on the call, and freshening the through flow with Arctic implications. Why should we care about the Bering Strait? The Pacific inflow influences about half of the Arctic Ocean. So it covers um, up to pretty much the Lomonosov Ridge, of the Arctic Ocean and it brings in waters with various properties that are important for a lot of Arctic processes. It brings in heat to melt ice, um, both to trigger the onset of ice and a subsurface source of heat for the Arctic, um, throughout half the Arctic, which can thin the ice because that heat is lost before the water leaves the Arctic again. It is important for marine life. It brings the most nutrient rich waters that enter the Arctic Ocean. So basically, if you're an ecosystem, you care where these waters go and how much there are. It's important for Arctic stratification. It rides above the Atlantic water in the Arctic and below the sea ice. So it provides a protection for the sea ice from the Atlantic water below. And with a bunch of physical oceanographers, I can just say it's a part of the freshwater budget and we all know that that's important. Um, it's about a third of the Arctic freshwater budget and we argue it is the largest interannually varying source. The other two major inputs being rivers and precipitation minus evaporation, but it seems that the Bering Strait is the one that varies most year to year. And this is not just about the Arctic, it's also about how the Arctic talks to the rest of the world. And there are modeling studies which show if you double the flow through the strait, you can influence the Gulf Stream and the overturning circulation in the North Atlantic. So these are reasons to care about the Bering Strait. Here is a Bering Strait on a nice day between Russia and Alaska. And the vital statistics of the strait make it a nice place to measure, mostly. It's not very wide, 85 kilometers wide. It's not very deep, 50 meters deep. Two channels of it with these little diamond islands in the center, which are home to people. Um, and the challenges are mostly it is ice covered from January to April, and it is split by the US-Russian border. But despite those challenges, we've had a long-term monitoring program in the Strait from 1990, year-round moorings. You see here the dotted line shows you the US-Russian border, and most of our moorings have been on the US side, but for significant periods, both in the 90s and the 2000s, we also got measurements over in the Russian waters. Um, if you want to know all about those mooring programs, these are good places to start. And if you want to put your instrument on these moorings, get in touch with me because we love to put other people's instruments on these moorings. For today's talk, I want you really to remember two things. One is to note when I say A3, I'm talking about this mooring just north of the strait, which we have shown with lots of past data to be a useful average of the flow coming through each of these channels. So A1 and A2. So A3, we tend to refer to as the climate site. And it's the one we talk about most as we look at long-term change. It gives you most of the flow that's going into the Arctic, but you should also add on the Alaskan coastal current. This is a sea surface temperature image showing this warm, it's also fresh current, which is seasonally along the coast in Alaska. Um, so the total flow is the climate site A3 plus the Alaskan coastal current, which we measure with A4. This is not quite so long a time series. It only starts in 2001. So mostly today I'm talking about long-term change and I'm talking about the climate site at A3. Okay, so jumping right in, what are we seeing in the long term three decades that we have data? And we're seeing pretty much significantly significant trends in transport increasing, temperature warming, and salinity freshening. Okay, so this is 
black is the A3 data. I've put the US channel in as well in gray to show you that we are capturing the signals with the A3 data. And I put the sea surface temperature here in red, um, which is also showing a significantly increasing warming trend, but not until these recent last recent years. The trend in the waters is more significant than the trend in the sea surface temperature. I want to point out this is the only Arctic gateway to be showing significant trends in the observational record at the minute. And these trends translate also into increasing heat and fresh water fluxes. Um, I'll give you the figures here and we will return to them later. Um, the minute I really want you to notice how much the ups and downs of this go with the transport. So there's big changes here um, and almost 50 percent or more increases since the 1990s. And to a large extent, that is driven by changes in the transport. So let's go look at the changes in the transport. We and others before us have typically split the transport into locally driven effects. That's the wind in the strait, the wind in the strait, and the flow through the strait are very well correlated, uh, 0.8. Um, and then a far field forcing, which is typically viewed as a pressure head forcing from the Pacific to the Arctic, the idea of the Pacific being higher and the waters run down into the Arctic. So we can fit hourly transport and wind data and solve for these, these coefficients in here, where this term is going to be the wind driven term and the residual that I can't explain, we blame on this far field. And we call this the pressure head forcing. So if I do that with the hourly data, I get this figure, which we've published in various forms for various years in the past. The black is the line you saw before, that's the total transport. And now I'm looking at the pressure head contribution and the contribution from the wind. It is worth noticing the zero line on this. So the wind actually opposes the main flow. So the Pacific is pushing the, the pressure head is pushing the water to the north, but the wind is slowing the flow. But also if you look at these, it's the, the green line here, the Pacific contribution, which really is giving you that trend. And you can see it by eye and we can prove it statistically. That the trends in the pressure head are significant, but there's no significant trend in the wind. So we say the long term trend is driven by the pressure head. And that's kind of just kicking the can down the road because I haven't explained why there was a trend in the pressure head. Yeah. That's actually proving quite tricky to get to the bottom of the trend, but we are now getting a lot better understanding of the variability. And I want to just highlight um, this other paper from 2017 using GRACE satellite data, ocean mass data, which showed basically the following mechanism. So we take high Arctic sea level pressure, which promotes westward winds along the Arctic coast, which promotes by Ekman the movement of waters off the East Siberian Sea over here, which is then really lowering the, the sea surface height in the Arctic, increasing that pressure head gradient and effectively pulling water north through the strait. And one of the interesting outcomes of this work was to show that Arctic variability not Pacific variability, Arctic variability was the dominant driver of variability in the strait. Now, the Pacific is still important, but the major part of it was going with the Arctic, which is interesting because in the past, we've always thought of this being forced from the south. Well, this is all statistics. Does it hold up to a more rigorous uh, analysis with GFD? Yes, in hand waving space and, and perhaps with um, more rigorous GFD as done by models, and I'm glad to say that it does. And this is a paper that Anne, Patrick, Heimbach and I got published last year, looking at the eco adjoint model. So eco model, if you're not familiar with it, it is an ice ocean model, very high class, top of the range, um, in agreement with vast numbers of data sets. And you can run this model forward and you get a simulation of the Arctic and the globe, ocean and ice circulation, and it does pretty well does very well. And one of the things that it simulates is the Bering Strait flow, which I'm going to call J. What we did in this paper is look at the adjoint. So the adjoint is a slightly different model. It's often described as running the model back in time. But really what it's doing is a numerical construction, which allows you to examine how any variable that you pick, like J here, the Bering Strait flow, is influenced by various forcings. So it can tell you dj d omega at all places. Easiest if I show an example. This is what the adjoint tells us about how the Bering Strait flow is affected by the northward wind 
over this area that I've picked out here. And so what you're seeing is what I told you earlier, that the northward flow through the strait is J, is influenced by the northward wind, okay? But I was telling you that for one point, and this model is telling you it for everywhere, and it's telling you at what lags. This is lagged over one month. And is this useful? Well, this is very useful if we can have enough of a linear system to see whether this then plays back into whether all these things sum up to make the flow that I thought of. So I can make a reconstruction, or rather, Anne can make a reconstruction, um, and we can reproduce J from the sum of all these influences. And what we find is that we can explain more than 90% of the Bering Strait flow variance by winds over various regions. Okay, right, so let's dig into that a little bit. Bit of a scary picture, but never mind. Here's a view of the world on the left, and at the top we have seasonal variability, and at the bottom we have interannual variability. And the sizes of these bars tell you how much each region, the color coding goes across here, influences here the seasonal variability and the interannual variability. So squint at that for a moment, and you'll see the dark colors are what is giving you most of the seasonal cycle and a lot of the interannual change. And so that is the areas around the strait, okay? as you might expect. But it is interesting that there are also significant lighter colored bars in this, which are showing far further field influences of the strait. And these areas turn out to be upstream of the strait in a Kelvin wave sense. So the idea is a uh, disturbance there will propagate along the topography, it's hand on the right hand wall, like a Kelvin wave should in the Northern hemisphere and influence the flow through the strait. There's many things you can pull out of this. You can stare at this for hours. I want to emphasize just one, which is this idea of, is it the Pacific or the Arctic, which is driving the variability? So now we have summed all of the Arctic and Atlantic influences in red and the Pacific influences in blue. And if you look at that, you can see that our previous claim that the Arctic is the main driver of the variability is still holding out in this, um, analysis, though the Pacific is important too. So this is understanding in some way what the transport variability is, and we're still working on the trends. We have to put that on a different day. I want to jump now to temperature and salinity and see how strange recent years have been in the strait. You see these a lot, so it's worth going through it. So what we have here is monthly 30-day smooth data. These are months, January, February, March, etc. The property we're thinking about, black is the climatology. So this is what we expect if we average all of the data that we've got in the strait from 1990. Gray is all the individual years. And red is the particular year that we're talking about. So here, 2006, 2007, 8, et cetera. And what we're seeing there quite clearly is really dramatic warming in last years. We've got temperatures here that are several degrees. This is in the 30-day mean. This isn't just one event. This is 30-day mean temperatures that are several degrees over what we expected to be normal. We've also got warm, warming earlier and cooling later. Let's dig into those. We can put numbers on those. You can read those faster than I can say them. But let's look at the time series because I find that is an easier way of getting these numbers into your head. Um, blue here is the sea ice and black is the data. Again, 30 days smoothed. What we're seeing, the warming, the first time above zero degrees C used to be around mid-June and now is turning up in May, okay? The cooling, the time, the last, the last time we had waters above zero degrees C used to be very clearly in November and now has moved into December plus, which all in all gives us a longer warm water time in the strait. Used to be less than six months is now definitely moving to seven months and beyond. So these are big forcings for ecosystems and indeed for the people that live in the area. Um, in addition to this extra warm period the ecosystems have to cope with, um, though I'm not highlighting it here, the increased flow means that the residence times of water in the Chukchi Sea has also decreased by about one and a half months since 1990. So because the flow is going faster, things are swept through the strait and off into the Arctic much quicker than they were before. So these are big changes that an ecosystem has to cope with. That heat also gives us big changes in what a physical system has to work, to, to work with. If we take the temperature and the transport, we combine those, we get a, a heat transport, and I can sum that by years. 
And these are some numbers that you find coming out of that. These are big numbers. Um, they are equivalent to melting about one to two times 10 to the six kilometers squared of ice, one meter ice per year. And to give you an idea of the scale of that, the seasonal change in sea ice extent in the Arctic is around 10, 10 of those units. And we can get one to two out of the change that we're seeing in this. Um, it is comparable in amount of energy as the solar that's coming into the Chukchi. And I've related this all to the freezing point of water because I'm interested in what heat is available to melt ice. We've roughly doubled it since 2000 due to warming and due to flow increase. What are the impacts of that? I talked before about this trigger of ice retreat, and it's worth just showing this picture again, which shows you the Chukchi on its side now, and the white arrows are the tongues of water coming into the Arctic, and you can see them melting back there into the ice edge, red, red here is ice. So they're bringing heat in, they're bringing, um, starting the melt of ice, opening up the water, which allows the solar radiation to be absorbed into the Arctic. So it's a trigger of Arctic sea ice retreat, and it's also a subsurface heat source to about half the Arctic, as we said before. This is the heat bombs that you've probably heard people talk about in recent, in recent days. Where is this going? Well, it's interesting in that one thing which is possibly having a big effect than we might expect is this earlier open water. So currently the water, um, when, when the sea ice retreats in the Chukchi Sea, it is the time of maximum solar heat coming into the region. So if we pull that back by a week or two, we have the potential to put a lot more solar heat, a lot more shortwave into the Arctic Ocean. Cooling later in the season does not have this dramatic amplification because by the time the waters are cooling, the shortwave is pretty much gone to zero. So we have the potential for a small modest change in open water to have a much bigger knock-on effect by what solar heat we could put into the system. There is however a limit on that. The most solar heat we could get is if we had the whole system ice-free all year round. But the amount of heat we can bring in from the ocean is much less bounded. It really depends just on the temperature that we have for incoming waters. So as we move into the future, I'm pretty sure we're looking at more heat coming in through here increasing the solar heat, shortwave heat significantly. But as we go through that, I suspect that oceanic heat flux is going to turn out to be an even bigger portion in what we are really doing. OK, let's jump from there to salinity and fresh water. I can do the same, make the fresh water transports. This is now looking at how it freshens the Arctic. And I can get some numbers out of this. And if you're interested in these numbers, here they, here they are. We're sort of increasing 50% of the fresh water since 2000. Um, and this is the largest interannual variability that I found in any freshwater source. So if you're looking at freshwater budgets of the Arctic, this is a term you need to take into account. Rivers don't change that much. Precipitation minus evaporation doesn't appear to change that much. The Bering Strait through flow does change. What is even more fascinating to me, though, is this annual mean change in temperature, in salinity. So mean, annual mean, sal mean salinities have dropped about 0.5 PSU since the 90s till now, okay? That's quite a lot, so let's dig into that a bit. Again, we've got these plots by year where red shows you the variation of that year. And look at the climatological cycle is what, you know, what I always taught in class. You have seawater, it freezes, you get brine rejection, salinity increases in winter, it's gonna melt, you're gonna get um, melt water freshening that, then the summer's quite boring and bland. And then in the autumn, you're getting mixing of river waters and, and fresher surface waters to the moorings. So this was our typical seasonal cycle, and this has completely gone away, right? So you see here, our winter salinities are now fresher than our summer salinities. If I look at the trends by month, all of my significant trends are in the winter. And what I've done effectively is freshen the winter by about one PSU. And this is a whole water column saga. I'm only showing you the bottom data here, but this turns up throughout the water column. And we've lost our prior seasonal cycle. Okay, so what's driving that? Why is that started? Drivers of freshening, of course, the first thing you say, a lot more freshening. You look for the Bering Sea rivers, the Yukon, etc., and they are way too small. They're about 200 cubic kilometers per year, and we need about 500. Okay, so you say, well, it's less sea ice, but, but no, the icy ice is thinning, that's true, but we can't explain the, the, it's not lack of blind rejection because we're actually freshening from the summer salinities. We have to have a fresh water source. Is it import of sea ice? Well, it could be import of sea ice, 
but the numbers when you work out would have to be huge and I don't think we can get them that big. And so we end up with what um, seems to be working out with the observational data that we have that this freshening is driven from the Gulf of Alaska and pretty much it's because you, you have increased river runoff, river and glacier melt runoff from Alaska, which is going up to the Unimac Pass, we can, an Aleutian chain, we can, we can test it there, we can see freshening there, and that is coming up to the strait. And the magnitude and timing that all kind of works out, that I would stress these are all back of the envelope um, calculations. What is the impact of that? The impact of that is we're changing the maximum salinities from the strait, which used to be around 33, and that was in winter, to now 32.5, and that's now in summer, not in winter. Okay, well, let's look at that a bit more. This is how things classically used to work. This is a TS diagram for those who like TS diagrams, and this is summing in volume class, so in salinity class, how much volume goes past my moorings. So this is a volumetric TS plot, and this is just looking at the volume in each salinity class. And this is doing what we thought it should do. In summer waters, they're fresher. The winter waters are saltier. So here we go. Pacific summer water there being fresh and Pacific winter water there being salty. That's how we thought things worked. But if we go to classic year nowadays, I've just picked one. This is 2018. Things look very different. And in particular, the winter water is now fresher than the summer water. So this is now our winter water and this is our summer water. And our waters down here have just completely gone away. OK, that was all in salinity and density is determined by salinity at these temperatures. So I can change that all into density because that determines where things go within the Arctic. And what we find is the Pacific winter water is now about 0.5 kilograms per meter cubed less dense than it was in the 90s. So let's go back to how we thought things worked. This is now the same picture you saw before. This is the old style stuff. And this is the density now in density class. And then this is what we expected to happen. Pacific summer water is less dense than Pacific winter water. And that's how it goes into the Arctic, right? That's how we layer our Arctic water column, Pacific summer water over Pacific winter water. But what are we seeing now? Now we're seeing, when I work these same volumes out, what we're seeing is the Pacific winter water is now about the same density as the Pacific summer water, okay? If you prefer to see this in a section to make sense, I'll take Bob's section from off the Beaufort slope. And we look at what the equilibrium depth of these waters, the winter waters would be of that section. And so Pacific water in the past came in about 100 to 150 meters, whereas now its equilibrium depth is about 50 to 100 meters. So it's shallower, 50 meters shallower. So remember, if you're an ecosystem, you care where this water is ending up. And it's also about the same as specific summer water depths. If you like to look at this in TS space, and of course, who wouldn't? What you see is the prior TS space. This is now a temperature salinity plot from the Chukchi borderland. So north of the north of the Chukchi Sea, showing silicate where the Pacific waters were high. This is 2002 data. And this is where the Pacific winter water used to end up. And this was the Pacific summer water. So this is where things used to be. And this is where our Pacific winter water is going now. So we have the data to quantify all of this. Let's take a classic cold halocline. This is the cold halocline here and consider all waters that are denser than, well, you pick these limits, whichever you prefer. And I can work out the volume that is going, the volume of water that is denser than the green line, that's the green line down here, and the volume of water denser than the black line, that's the black line down here. And so these black and green, particularly the green, are the waters that are ventilating the traditional cold halocline. And this red one is the stuff that is that is not. And if you work those numbers out, what you're seeing is since the 90s, in the 1990s, about 0.3 sphere drips of water, that's kind of this amount, was going into the cold hayline. And since 2014, almost none. And so this is the basis of the fundamental claim of the title. The Pacific winter water is no longer ventilating the Arctic's cold halocline. Now, Rebecca, you're gonna say, wait, 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 this is in the Bering Strait. You've got to get it through the Chukchi, off of the Chukchi. Surely we can make up for this in the Chukchi. And the short answer to that very long question is no, I don't think you can. If you look at all the numbers that you would have to, the ice formation you'd have to get to wipe this out, I don't think you can do it. And to give you an idea of why you can't do it, to remember, we've got to make a one PSU change in 50 meters of water, we, didn't, we need an extra two meters of ice formation. 
And nothing that we're seeing in the chuck sheet at the minute is saying there is an increase in CI sickness. If anything, there is a decrease. So this is care I wanted to get today, the idea that there's change in recent years. And this is pretty much as you would expect with climate warming, earlier warming, later cooling, longer warmer water time. You maybe wouldn't expect that the flow would increase. It is increasing significantly, giving you shorter residence times and the significant trends in all these, these properties with these large changes in heat and fresh water flux of the strait. We can dig into some of that and understand why the long-term trend we blame on the pressure head, not on wind. And we're finding that variability is driven mostly from the Arctic, though the Pacific remains important. This is, we can't neglect the Pacific entirely. But I think most intriguing is this winter freshening. The idea that we have brought in now Pacific winter waters that are very much fresher than they were before. They're now fresher than the summer waters and they are similar density to the summer waters. So they're entering the Arctic about 50 meters shallower than they were before and at the same depth as the summer waters, which means we're not ventilating the Arctic Ocean's cold halocline. Okay, I'll leave it there. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you, Rebecca. And uh, please speak up if you have any questions, comments. Shall I read them out of the chat? Rebecca, this is this is John Tool. Okay. A very nice body of work. I, I'm really impressed. Um, one thing to I just wanted to mention is that the uh, the interior of the Canada Basin, the Beaufort Gyre area, is also getting very fresh. So where your water is on the shelf end up is going to be in a different, maybe in a different strata in the interior. So you know. You can't look at a 2002 interior and say the shelf water is going to end up at 150 meters shallower since the interior now is so much fresher and lighter than it was back then. But, yeah, uh, I think there's, I mean, how this plays out into the Arctic is going to be interesting. I mean, what we're saying, we are changing what used to be that really ubiquitous 33.1 PSU water. It always seemed to be there. It was always there on our TSP plots. It's always 33.1. And we had some ideas on that coming from the, you know, that's the, the dense salinity of waters that is pushed up from the Pacific. Um, what the impact of this, does this mean we're just going to reform the cold halocline fresher? Maybe, maybe that's the answer. But if we don't see the Atlantic freshening, then we are going to be increasing the stratification as well. Yeah, how this plays out in detail in the Arctic is going to be fascinating. And, and also, you've got to try Louise and make sure the models it. are seeing this to see that as well. And also, as we're getting warmer, we can't just say salinity is dictating density. Right, though it is still doing most of it. I mean, that's why we now have the Pacific winter water is fresher than the summer water, yet it's about the same density because it's cold. Right. Thank you. I see there's a comment in the chat here from Mary Louise. Sea surface, sea surface temperature wasn't increasing at the same rate as waters measured the depth of the mooring. Yeah, so this is um, pretty much in our 2018 paper when we looked for trend in annual mean SST, there was no significant trend, right? So this, but we always had a trend in the warming of the waters. So what we're saying is sea surface temperature is not telling us the whole story. Right, it is the waters below which are bringing up the biggest change in the heat, not the SST. Does that answer? Yeah, your question? thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, um, uh, Rebecca. Th thank you. I, I think we need to move on. Oh, okay, uh, okay, I understand. understand okay, thank you. Thank very you very much for a very interesting overview. And uh, let's turn our attention to Bob Pickard. Um, he's going to talk about the fate of Pacific water north of Bering Strait. Uh, Bob, please, it's, it's all yours. I'm sorry, I had to unmute myself first. Thanks. Okay, can uh, someone confirm that they can see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, super, thanks. All right, so, um, I'm Bob Pickard. I'm an uh, observational physical oceanographer, oceanographer at the Woodsall Oceanographic Institution. And uh, here's the title of my talk, Fate of Pacific Water North of Bering Strait, 
Uh, before I get into it, I would like to acknowledge my postdoc, Peg and Len, um, who uh, did the lion's share of what I'm going to present today. And I also want to acknowledge these folks here. I'm going to pre be presenting some uh, results from some new papers that were authored by these individuals here. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm using some bearing straight data. Thank you, Rebecca. And lastly, uh, these are the funding agencies that supported the work. Okay, um, here's an outline of what I'm gonna tell you about today. Uh, I'll start with the flow across the Chukchi Shelf and its connection to Bering Strait. Uh, then I'll move north uh, and then look at the outflow from Barrow Canyon. And then after that, I'll look a little bit further downstream away from Barrow Canyon uh, and consider the pathways and variability of the Pacific water. All right, here's part one, flow across the Chukchi Shelf and its connection to Bering Strait. So um, we addressed that question by considering a single year. And the year was 2013-14, which was an extraordinary year because there were 27 different moorings deployed on the Chukchi Shelf from, from Bering Strait out to the, to the uh, Chukchi Slope uh, by these six different institutions. So uh, the group of us put this data together and uh, we've done a couple of studies now, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the last part of the second study where we considered the um, uh, uh, connection of the flow on a shelf to Bering Strait. All right, here are the mean, uh, year-long mean uh, depth average vectors uh, for that year. Um, you have very strong flow through Bering Strait, very strong flow along the coastal pathway, and we have the uh, familiar clockwise circulation around the top of Hannah Shoal. All right, so to look at the variability, we did an EOF analysis, and I'm going to show you results of that. Um, we considered two modes, uh, and I, I'm going to present these modes, um, and I want to show, uh, point out that when I present these, um, they're going to look at uh, plots like this, where the light vectors are the mean vectors that I just showed you, and the dark vectors are going to be the different states of the EOF. All right, so here's mode one, which explained about 50% of the variance, and here's the positive state of the mode. And essentially, you can see that the mean flow was enhanced. That's the bottom line of that, that state of the EOF. If you look at the negative state of the EOF, now you see that the flow is, is mostly reversed up here in the northeast shelf, and it's largely reduced in Barrow Canyon, in uh, Bering Strait. And the reason for that are the winds. And that's shown here. Uh, here are the winds during the positive state. You have a strong southerly flow in Bering Strait, which helps to enhance the, the northward flow there. And we have southwestward flow, a uh, southwesterly flow um, that enhances the flow along the corridor here. By contrast, in the negative state, we have strong northerly flow in Bering Strait, which wants to um, um, reduce the flow there. And we have um, northeasterly flow uh, along the corridor here, which tends to reverse the flow in this part of the shelf. Okay, so this was really no surprise. This was the dominant mode, it explained 50%. Uh, the next mode is perhaps more interesting, and it explained about 25% of the variance. And here's the positive state of this mode. Uh, again, we have strong flow in the northeast part of the shelf, but now we actually have uh, reduced flow in, in Bering Strait, which is opposite of what, it, what I just showed you in that previous mode. And in the negative state of the mode, we have reversed flow up here in the northeast, but now we have enhanced flow in Bering Strait. So you can see Bering Strait seems to be out of phase um, with the northeast part of the shelf. And again, we can explain that due to the winds. Here are the winds during the positive state, strong northerly winds here that tend to um, uh, reduce the flow through Bering Strait. And now we have northwesterly winds up here, which actually uh, helps to, um, to enhance the flow uh, through, uh, through Barrow Canyon. And by contrast, in the negative state, we have very weak winds in Bering Strait, which is conducive for stronger flow. And now we have easterly winds here uh, in, in the Northeast, which again can tend, uh, tend to reverse the flow. Okay, so uh, let's put this all together and take a look at how the direction of the flow on the shelf seems to be related or not to the flow through Bering Strait. So here I'm showing the maximum state of the EOF. This is when, when the flow was very enhanced, okay, going to the North. And here's the maximum state of mode two. So the direction is the same here in a Northeast corridor, but now it's reversed in Bering Strait. And you can see on the mid shelf here, the flow tends more to the South in this condition. And here's the minimum state of the EOF. Now we have reverse flow all through the Northeast part of the shelf. 
But in mode two, now we have, again, northward flow through the strait. We still have the same flow direction in this uh, northeast corridor. But now, when you have this northward flow in, 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 in the strait, the flow tends more to the north in the central part of the shelf. OK, so southward flow in the strait, southward tending flow all through the shelf, northward flow in a strait, northward tending flow um, through the shelf. OK, so that's a quick summary of, of these EOF calculations. And, and I'd like to mention that we are now, uh, as our next study, uh, we're going to be looking at propagating signals uh, from Bering Strait uh, up through the shelf and the role of shelf waves. OK, moving to the second part of the talk, uh, moving to the north to consider the outflow from Barrow Canyon. Well, it's now well established that the outflow from Barrow Canyon splits. Part of it goes to the right, forms the Beaufort Shelf Break Jet. Part of it goes to the left and forms the Chukchi Slope Current. So now I'd like to uh, uh, present to you some, some recent work that talks a little bit more about the kinematics and dynamics of the split here in Barrow Canyon. So first, I'd like to uh, show some results from a paper that's just now in press, uh, a numerical model um, led by Heng Yang, uh, Lang. And, um, and here I'm showing you uh, the, um, from the model, the annual mean conditions average over the Pacific water layer, all right? And you can see here the flow coming through Barrow Canyon, and it, it indeed splits, part of it going to the shelf break jet, part of it going into the slope current. However, one of the interesting things that popped out of this model was that uh, in the mean, they had a westward flow here in the Beaufort Slope that was actually contributing to the Chukchi Slope current. And when they consider this box and look at the volume transport of the 0.45 sphere drips in the Chukchi Slope current, only about 65% of it actually came from the Chukchi Shelf from Barrow Canyon, and roughly 35% actually came from this westward flow uh, from the Beaufort Slope. And in the paper, they went into a little bit more about the nature of that flow. So what do the observations tell us? So here I'd like to present some work from, from a paper that's in, pre, in, in preparation. And in this paper, uh, Lynn et al. Uh, combined uh, three different um, uh, composite um, databases, hydrographic databases, into one very large hydrographic data, data set going from 1970 to 2020. And uh, you can see that most of the measurements are here are after, after the year 2000. And also want to point out that most of the measurements are in the summertime season. So that's the hydrographic data set. And we've also compiled a shipboard ADCP data set on the Chukchi Shelf and a little bit into the Canada Basin um, from 2002 to the present. And again, most of the measurements are in the summertime. So I want to uh, uh, point out that what I'm going to show you now um, is really applying to the summer seasons, the, the warm months of the year. All right, so we know from previous studies that the flow in Barrow Canyon is most sensitive to the Long Canyon winds. So let's consider composite averages of the circulation and the presence of Pacific summer water corresponding to different Long Canyon wind conditions. So here's the first composite. So here's when the winds are coming uh, out of the Southwest um, towards the Northeast here. So here's the mean wind vector, all right? And in this condition, we have strong flow through Bering Strait and then it splits into the shelf break jet, Chukchi slope current. And the color here corresponds to the percentage of the Pacific summer water. All right, so you can see that there is Pacific summer water in both of these flow branches. Now, what happens when the wind is weak in this area? And there's actually a very small mean vector that you can't see. And in this condition, you still have strong flow through Barrow Canyon. Some of it splits to the right, some of it splits to the left. And in both cases, there's Pacific summer water. All right, now, in the, I just got through telling you that when you have strong northeasterly winds, you can reverse the flow in Barrow Canyon. So what happens now when we, when we consider northeasterly winds? Now, this next composite is weak northeasterly winds. So it's not enough to reverse the flow in Barrow Canyon. You can still see that we still have flow coming through the canyon, and it still splits. Some of it goes to the left, some of it goes to the right. However, now you can see the emergence of some westward flow that's come from the Beaufort Slope. And then the last composite, which is strong northeasterly winds, now the flow is indeed reversed in Barrow Canyon. So it's coming up the canyon. Um, but again, we have Pacific summer water present in both this side and this side. All right, so these are the four composites. Now, there are some interesting things that sort of come out of these composites, all right? Um, number one is under, and again, this is the summertime period, under all conditions, under all wind conditions, we have a Chukchi slope current. That's number one. And 
that Chukchi slope current is carrying Pacific summer water. All right. However, in light of the fact that the Pacific summer water had to come from the Chukchi shelf, one would think, at least I, I would have thought, that when you have reverse flow in the canyon, you'd have the least amount of Pacific water in the Chukchi slope current. But you can see that the, that the opposite is true. This is a condition when you have most of the Pacific summer water. And in fact, as you reduce those winds and reverse them, all right, you have less and less Pacific summer water in the Chukchi slope current. So that's perhaps a bit uh, counterintuitive. However, there are a couple of things to consider. Number one is when you have this very strong flow coming through Barrow Canyon, it shoots out into a bit into the interior and it can mix with ambient water out here that doesn't have any Pacific summer water. So that can explain why you have a weaker signal um, out in here. And under these same conditions, when you have flow turning to the right, there's plenty of Pacific summer water sitting out here so that the wind, when the winds reverse and the current reverses, it can bring that summer water back towards Barrow Canyon and into the slope current. For instance, here and here. This is going to just carry the water right into the slope current. Okay, so um, as I showed you just a, a minute ago in the numerical model, they said in the mean, there's a contribution to the slope current coming from the uh, Beaufort slope. These results that I'm showing you now suggest that maybe winds play a role in this. And in fact, maybe you only get that uh, westward flow when you have very strong wind conditions, all right? Because indeed, that's the only case where we can see westward flow that doesn't have any Pacific water, uh, summer, uh, Pacific summer water in it, okay? Um, so anyway, clearly some more work to, to be sorting out here ab about this westward flow that feeds the slope current. All right, so let's uh, go to the last section of my talk where we go away from Barrow Canyon, uh, look farther downstream at the pathways and variability of the Pacific water. All right, back to the numerical model. Uh, so uh, in, in the model, they uh, released a tracer in Barrow Canyon to see where the, where the water goes. All right, so in this box, they released the tracer and, and here's a snapshot of the concentration of the tracer. And you can see some of it turned to the right, no surprise, some of it turned to the left, no surprise. But what perhaps is a bit interesting is as you go downstream in the slope current, it seems to bifurcate. Some of it, a tongue, heads off uh, uh, to the west uh, towards the East Siberian Sea, and some of it veers to the north along the edge of the Beaufort Gyre, that's what this dashed line is, and actually starts to penetrate the gyre. So here's a way that Pacific water can actually start to penetrate the Beaufort Gyre. And again, this is a model tracer. So. Um, what do the observations tell us? Well, there's actually some pretty uh, convincing evidence that this bifurcation actually happens. So in this picture, I'm showing you the mean Beaufort gyre uh, based on many years of um, sea surface height from al uh, the altimeter. And that's in color here. So here's the high sea surface height of the Beaufort gyre. Uh, here are the contours, uh, which are the streamlines of the gyre. All right. Down here, I'm showing you a snapshot of the outflow from Barrow Canyon, uh, and that was something we did on the, on the Healy back in 2018. Again, showing the water emerging from the canyon, some of it turning to the right, some of it turning to the left and forming the Chukchi slope current. So we uh, uh, did a collaboration um, when we did this uh, survey with um, the Sekuliak. Um, and there were some researchers on the Sekuliak who a couple of weeks after our survey uh, dropped or launched five profiling Argo floats in the Chukchi slope current. That's what the green dots are here. And then they were off and running. And you can see that for a while they, they hung along the continental slope, but then veered northward and penetrated into the Beaufort gyre uh, before uh, disappearing underneath the ice. So that's consistent with this pathway that ventilates the um, Beaufort gyre. At the same time, we have another study that where we're looking at um, two years worth of boring data on the continental slope um, as part of the SBI program uh, back in the early 2000s. And there's clear evidence of the Chukchi slope current in that seaward mooring here. All right. This is actually evidence of the Chukchi shelf break jet flowing the opposite direction. So that's evidence of this pathway here. All right. So we really do see a bifurcation in the observations as well. Now, the numerical model study argued that the, the flow on the outer continental slope is, is, is the part that's going to uh, ventilate the gyre. The stuff on the intercontinental slope is going to go uh, towards the East Siberian Sea. Uh, but that's, this may also be time dependent as well. So I think there's more work to be done on, on this, uh, this bifurcation. OK, so for the last part of my talk, I want to talk a, a bit now about the fate of the Beaufort uh, shelf break jet. 
and I'm going to use observations. And in particular, uh, back in, in 2002 to 2004, as part of the SPI program, I put a mooring array, a high resolution mooring array uh, across the uh, shelf and slope of, of the Beaufort Sea just downstream of Barrow Canyon. And here are the depth mean vectors, uh, two year mean vectors. And you can see clearly uh, here is your Beaufort shelf break jet. In fact, this mooring array was the first uh, real uh, convincing evidence that there was even a shelf break jet. OK, so. Um, uh, you can see that, you know, again, the, the, the strongest flow is right at the shelf break. So a couple of years or uh, several years after the uh, SBI program, I was able to get an Aon um, program funded where we have instrumented um, a, a, this current with a single mooring here, a, the, the BS3 mooring uh, in the center of the shelf break jet. And we've had that there um, since 2008 and it's still on the water today. So I'd like to show you some results uh, from this um, uh, expanding time series. So here's the monthly mean transport over this time period, 2002 to 2020. And you can see there's a very clear seasonality. All right. So from the months of June to October, you're clearly getting this, the, the most transport. All right. So uh, considering those months, let's look at the interannual signals. All right. So here's the transport during those months of the year from June to October. And you can see that there's uh, some interesting variability uh, uh, during this time period. Now, what's the, the reason for this variability? Well, we think the main reason is um, due to the local winds, um, in particular, the zonal winds. And you know, when you have easterly winds, it tends to oppose the shelf break jet. When you have westerly winds, it tends to enhance the shelf break jet. And indeed, if you look at the wind time series uh, from those months of the year, June through October, that's the blue curve. Uh, you can see there's a clear relationship between the red bars and the blue curve, okay? Uh, it's correlated to 0.7. So I think that's the dominant reason. However, I want to point out these last few years, uh, you know, this the correlation seems to be breaking down. So that's uh, interesting to me, and it'll be uh, uh, good to see what what uh, happens going forward to see if there's some other circumstances involved uh, with what's setting the variability in this transport. Okay, uh, so the, the last thing I wanted to do in this talk is show some results from the hydrographic data that we have from this nice long time series. Um, um, so. Uh, Peg and I were poised to do that, and then um, last week, uh, Rebecca's paper showed up in GRL, um, which she just talked about, this really um, uh, neat idea about how the, the uh, ventilation is changing uh, due to the winter water. So we thought we would uh, take a look at the winter water signal in our data. So over the last week or so, we've been having some fun with that, so I'm going to show you some very uh, new results, very preliminary results. So uh, the paper that Rebecca and, and uh, Peralta Ferez did, um, argue that the Pacific winter water is now too fresh to ventilate the interior cold halocline versus several decades ago based on their uh, Bering Strait data. Now, of course, as Rebecca pointed out, um, Bering Strait is not, you know, right next to the interior. It's got to cross the Chukchi Shelf and, and, you know, and then it's got to get into one of these currents, the slope current and the shelf break jet, and then it's got to get itself off those currents and get into the interior somehow. So there's some steps that have to happen uh, between Bering Strait and the interior halocline. So we'll ask the question um, here, how have the winter water conditions been varying in the Beaufort shelf break jet, which does directly ventilate the Canada Basin via eddy exchange and downwelling when driven downwelling? So here I'm showing you uh, a, a time series of volume, volumetric TS, all right, uh, from each of the years that we have data, where the color is the percentage of the water uh, in the shelf break jet uh, tabulated by TS class. All right, so the warm colors are, are the higher, higher percentages. So you can see here that most of the water in the shelf break jet is the winter water. All right, and that's what, this, that's what these red uh, uh, regions are. So looking from year to year, there's clearly some uh, variability, but by and large, there doesn't seem to be a large trend. And in fact, the variability doesn't, even, it doesn't seem to be all that great. So we quantified that by finding the particular TS class that had the maximum amount of, of volume. All right, maximum amount of presence. And, and we made a time series of that in TS space. So that's what the stars are here. And the color is time going from blue in the early 2000s to, to red, to, which is now uh, present. So interestingly, there's, again, there's no trend, right? And there's not even a lot of scatter, you know, except for that point there, they, they seem to be sort of clustered in this one area. And interestingly, when now when we put on the limits of the halocline, all right, you can see that most of this water is indeed not ventilating the upper halocline. So that's consistent with what Rebecca was just telling us. 
All right. However, there is more to the story here because I want to point out that this is the yearly winter water TS mode. All right. That's you know where most of the water is, but that's not to say that there isn't water that can ventilate the halocline that's being uh, evicted into shelf break jet. So what we did next then is we tabulated all the time periods when there was winter water uh, colder than minus 1.6 that had the salinity that was salty enough to be within the upper halocline and even the lower halocline. So the upper halocline water is blue, the lower halocline water is red. All right, so here's each of the years the months of the year and each of the years that we have data. So you can see there's a non-trivial amount of time when the shelf break jet is indeed uh, advecting water that can ventilate the upper halocline and even a, a little bit of the lower halocline. So if you sum up by months here, you uh, a clear season, seasonal signal emerges, all right? And it tells us that you know during the spring months is when we tend to have uh, this halocline water being advected by the mooring. And, and, I, and this is consistent with emanating from the Chukchi shelf, all right? The timing is about right, all right? And also, I want to point out that this is the really cold water, all right? So this water here that's colder than minus 1.6 had to have formed the previous winter. It's not several winters old. It had to form the previous winter. So that plus the timing makes it look like it came from the Chukchi shelf. And again, you know, in a given month, you can have upwards of 30% of the water that's able to ventilate the upper halocline. If you do the same exercise by year now, all right, you can see again, um, it, by year, you can have some significant amounts of this water up, you know, 20, 25% of the water during the year can ventilate the upper halocline and a little of it even the lower halocline as well. Again, there's no trend, but I do wanna point out that uh, intriguingly the last couple of years, we seem to have less. So again, it'll be nice to have our ongoing time series to see where, the, where this goes. So uh, is this at odds with, with uh, Rebecca's results? Well, uh, I just want to point, a couple, uh, point out a couple of things to consider. Um, one is uh, Ito et al. Uh, demonstrated that the Northeast Chukchi uh, Polina can be as important as Bering Strait in providing salt to the winter water that outflows from Barrow Canyon. So what, what they demonstrated here is that, you know, when you have a, a persistent presence of this polynia, all right, you're forming ice, you're rejecting the salt, and then the ice gets blown away and you, and, and you do the same thing. And you can do this for months during the year, and it can supply a lot of salt uh, to, to the water that's directly in the pipeline that's going to feed the Beaufort shelf break jet. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And the other thing to keep in mind is based on a couple of studies now, we've shown that the outflow from Barrow Canyon can be subject to intense mixing due to fast growing instabilities, all right? And that just means that you're gonna mix water um, from just out uh, seaward of Barrow Canyon. And, and I showed you that earlier with this specific summer water presence. You know, when the outflow was, was zooming into the interior, you lost some of that uh, signal of the Pacific summer water. So I think what that, this is telling us is what we're seeing in the Beaufort shelf break jet. Yes, a lot of it comes from the Chukchi shelf, but not all of it. There's some, some um, signature from, flow, from, from the water just seaward of uh, Barrow Canyon. So anyway, clearly lots more to do to, to, to tie out, to figure out what's going on here and, and tie it together with what's happening in Bering Strait. All right, so let me conclude then. The two dominant modes of circulation on the eastern Chukchi shelf are oppositely phased with the Bering Strait inflow. I should say the second dominant mode, not both dominant modes. Sorry about that. Uh, and, and, and both modes are dictated predominantly by the shelf-wide wind patterns. The Chukchi slope current is present in the summertime in all wind conditions, but more Pacific summer water enters the current when there is wind force westward flow from the Beaufort slope versus strong outflow from Barrow Canyon. The Chukchi slope current ultimately splits into different branches with part of the flow becoming entrained into the Beaufort gyre. The Beaufort shelf break jet transport has varied significantly over the last two decades. It seems to be largely dictated by local summertime winds, although in the last couple of years, maybe that's starting to change. And finally, the yearly winter water mode in the Beaufort shelf break jet is indeed lighter than the upper halocline. However, during the spring months, up to 30% of the water is dense enough to ventilate the upper halocline. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and uh, we probably have a little bit of time for one or two quick questions. So if you have a question, please speak up or you can post your questions in the chat box. Bob, I've got a question. Sure. Um, 
I, I really like the data coming off that um, that uh, mooring in the um, in your Beaufort shelf break. I, I think I gave you a hard time about funding that, so it's it's actually nice. <laughs> It's nice to see some long-term data come out of that. So if I did, I apologize. Um, about 49%, if I did the math right, of that transport you, you think is due to wind. Um, that's, that's good. Can you speculate on the other half percent, the, the other half of the uh, driving force? Uh, good question, Will. Um, I haven't really uh, thought that through, to tell you the truth. Um, yeah. So that's something for us to look into. And especially as I pointed out in, in the last couple of years, it actually doesn't even seem to be varying with the, with the summertime winds. So um, yeah, that's something for us to, to tease out. Um, you know, I will mention that, you know, this it's taken a, a, us a while to accumulate these data. So we're now at a good point where we have enough variability to start actually look, you know, delving into to, to, to what the signal is and, and what's causing it. So yeah, good question. All right, well, good argument for continued funding. <laughs> Can I jump in, Bob? That's a nice talk. I'd have to go away and crunch those numbers. I did not. We'll have to see whether the Northeast Polonia can do it. Um, be interesting to compare the numbers there. And I'm wondering, then, you've got a circulation which is when the water is not going down Barrow Canyon, it's going somewhere else, right? And so we don't have much handle on how that. You know, what do we what do we think now? The percentage of the Bering Strait that goes into the Barrow Canyon is still about what a third, a half. Uh, well, according to Ito et al., it's, you know, 0.42 sphere drips. Um, right, so about Chukchi a half. Slope, yeah, so, yeah, and the Chukchi slope current is about, you know, 0.5 sphere drips, a little bit more. So, yeah, uh, it's, there's, you know, there's a lot of flow coming through Barrow Canyon that came from Bering Strait, but not all of it, as, as you just noted, yes. Mm -hmm. And do you see, I mean, do you see a straight boring freshening trend? You don't, then, in your data? Uh, not in the winter water. Right. So now, I, again, I want to I want to you know qualify that these are you know we we just put these results together. Um, so and 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 the first crack at it was looking at vo just volume, presence of water. So the the next thing we want to do is actually look at transport. Okay. Yeah, because I think that. So that's on our list as well. Yeah. Although the first look at that made it look like it's going to be consistent, but again, we we need to do that carefully. Yeah, be interested in teaming up with you on that. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Bob. And let's turn our attention to Jamie Morrison. And he's going to talk about CI's uh, service in the Beaufort Sea. Please go ahead, Jamie. Okay. Let's see if I can get this going. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a program we've had for the last few years uh, to study the retreat of the of the sea ice and the seasonal sea ice zone of the uh, of the Beaufort Sea, and it's a project called Seasonal Sea Ice Zone uh, Reconnaissance Surveys uh, or Scissors, uh, and the PIs are are Axel Schweiger and uh, Mike Steele, uh, along with me, and then we have a bunch of people that uh, that really make all this happen and I've I realized that uh, I've forgotten to put uh, uh, Cecilia on that list of special thanks so uh, I'll, I'll explain that a little later so the the whole idea here is to try and understand what controls the uh, ice edge retreat and how that varies interannually uh, and so our our objective in the experimental program was to track the changes in the atmosphere and the ocean uh, across the seasonal sea ice zone through the summer retreat of ice and do that for a, a number of, of uh, seasons, uh, summer seasons. And to do that, we, we really wanted to get out uh, before the melt began and go right up until freeze up started. And so we, we had to get out, uh, really out into the Beaufort Sea uh, before ships could commonly uh, get out there. And the solution uh, came from the US Coast Guard, uh, air station Kodiak, uh, who flies C-130s out uh, for 
all kinds of things, mostly rescuing fishermen and that kind of stuff. But uh, the Coast Guard had a program uh, called uh, Arctic Domain Awareness, and uh, it really kind of got going uh, 2009. Um, and as part of that, they offered uh, science of opportunity positions on their on their flights. And so we've actually done some experiments using uh, aircraft expendable probes uh, starting in 2007. But then we first started uh, in 2009 participating in these ADA flights. And the whole point is to drop, basically to do a hydrographic survey, uh, but use aircraft. And so uh, this cartoon illustrates kind of the idea. We typically uh, take off and, and we have a few standard lines, but one of our mainstays is a, is a line up 150 west. And we might fly out at, uh, as we get out over the ice, we'll fly at low altitude and uh, drop oceanographic probes. So we drop uh, expendable current probes and air expendable uh, CTDs and buoys. Um, and then we'll get out to the ice edge or a little beyond and uh, turn around and climb to about 10,000 feet. And we fly back making a kind of the atmospheric version by dropping atmospheric uh, drop sons as we go back. So here are a few of the, the instruments. Uh, this is a picture of Axel Schweiger looking at one of his drop sons, and these are really pretty tiny things thrown out of the plane at uh, 10,000 feet. And they, uh, they have a little parachute and, and fall through the, through the atmosphere down to the surface. And <clears throat> the, uh, there's a receiver that we attach to the aircraft antennas and with that receiver, we received the signals from these, from these drop sons. They include a GPS. In that picture, he's at the observer window trying to get a GPS lock uh, for his drop sond prior to tossing it out of the plane. And this is typically, this is a nice picture that shows uh, one of the crewmen going back to the back ramp. We open the back ramp of the C-130 and we can toss very big things out the back. But in this case, it was a little, little tiny, tiny uh, drop sound. These are uh, some temperature and humidity profiles. Uh, and they're compared to, I think it's the uh, Wharf model. Uh, and so we get, uh, we get pretty nice uh, temperature profiles and, and humidity profiles. Uh, Big part of this is trying to track where the where the cloud layers are, and the humidity helps helps with that part of it. Uh, the AXCTD uh, the CTD profiles are made at ocean stations, typically every about degree of latitude, uh, going up, for example, 150 west. Uh, and those are the AXCTDs, and the current shear is measured with ex aircraft expendable current probes. And from those, we can derive uh, internal wave energy and mixing profiles using these uh, AXCPs. This is a video that shows dropping an AXCP, excuse me, AXCTD. I think I got carried away here. Well, it's not working. There's a video, and for some reason, it's not playing. That's too bad. It's oh, there we go. So it's pretty simple. These guys are back on the ramp. They're Coast Guard crewmen, and they have uh, the probes in hand. And uh, it's kind of wonderful to see the video of of the ice and water going by, and then uh, and then watching, especially if it's a small target, small bit of open water, how good they can be at uh, tossing the probes in. And there you see the probes just little tiny dots on the water surface. And like the atmospheric drop sons, we have a, a receiver and a kind of a recording desk inside the airplane. And uh, when, the, when the AXCTD, for example, hits the surface, there's a, a float that stays at the surface and a probe falls out of that float 
trailing a very fine wire that sends the, the CTD data back up that fine wire. And then there's a radio transmitter in the float at the surface, which, uh, which broadcasts back in a VHF uh, radio signal. And we pick that up on our receiver as the, as the airplane typically uh, loiters in the area by circling around the place that we, we drop the probe. And it takes about, uh, takes about 10 minutes to get the probe down to 10,000 meters, and then we can go on our way. And this is an example of, a, of a temperature, salinity, and density profiles from one, from one of those drops. We also drop up-tempo buoys. These are Mike Steele's buoys, on, and uh, they have a little temperature uh, chain that hangs down to 60 meters. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty clever system, uh, how you get this thing out of the airplane into the water and how you can have it uh, deploy its own little string of temperature probes. And this shows the, the uh, box going out of the plane. The, the up-tempo is in that cardboard box. And uh, we, we call that the washing machine because it's about the size of a washing machine. And, uh, Falls off the back of the ramp in this picture, and you can see it going down. There's a static line that deploys a parachute, and here's the here's the up tempo falling through the air. And now you see the picture of a buoy that's that, an up tempo buoy that's in the water. It's basically a cardboard box floating on the surface, and uh, we also drop the air expendable CTD and XCP uh, at the same spot. And then the magic is that this cardboard box is held together with, with mucilage type tape, like, uh, like um, tape that you'd put, it, put together a, a mail package. And, and the parachute and the whole thing is sort of held together with some straps that are salt blocks, uh, constrained by salt blocks. So the salt blocks dissolve and the tape sort of dissolves and the whole cardboard box falls apart on the surface of the, of the ocean. And then the weighted uh, uh, temperature chain falls out of the box. And eventually you get basically just a buoy sitting in the water. Sometimes it can, in the cold water of the Beaufort Sea, sometimes it can take a day to get all that stuff dissolved and, and away from the, the device. Uh, we drop uh, buoys for the International Arctic Buoy Program. Ignatius Rigger comes along on a lot of flights and uh, this is an example of one of the buoys he drops, and it's it's kind of a jack-in-the-box arrangement. It's uh, the uh, Axib buoy, and uh, you can show a picture of the crew flying along and uh, getting ready to drop one of these buoys out the back. And this buoy uh, is pretty clever, too, because it it goes out and, and the surface mass, the mass that holds the atmospheric sensors is in a sh covered by a shroud. And that shroud, uh, when it gets near the, near the surface and the parachute is released, uh, that shroud flops apart and a mass sort of self erects and you basically get a, get a buoy on the surface that it can either be in water or, yeah, I guess basically we would drop these in water, but then even after the water freezes up, uh, you've got a mass on, on top of, a, of, a, of an atmospheric uh, a MET buoy. Uh, this is a location we've also used uh, a, a spot inside the airplane to look down with an IR camera and we're working on a scheme to have a little LIDAR so that we can do some profiling of the, of the surface. Okay, so this is an example of the kind of data we get. This is from September 2014, uh, our September flight. And in the top panel on the left is the atmospheric uh, temperature versus uh, latitude and versus uh, altitude. And on the lower right, in a vastly different scale, uh, vertically anyway, is the uh, is, uh, let's see, that's the salinity profile going across basically the, the Beaufort Gyre. And, uh, and then in the middle, we've got some, uh, 
uh, imagery of the sea ice conditions and little green, red, and blue plots that indicate where up-tempo buoys uh, deployed during that year uh, drifted. And it's kind of interesting. You can see a, a basically these sort of uh, parallel gyres in the in the signature signature of the ocean and in the signature of the atmosphere. The uh, monthly sections that we do. This was again 2014, but uh, what, this is from a paper by Sarah Dewey, and in the upper are the sections that we made monthly in 2014. And they're pasted out there. When I, and excuse me, and on top of those are uh, renditions of the, uh, of the uh, ice concentration. And you can see, for example, in June, the ice concentration is basically 100%. Uh, there are a few little dark splotches which indicate low concentration. In July, we just see the ice edge starting to advance. And then in August, things are really getting going. And by September, basically more than half of the, of the section was in open water and then back into ice. And the thing that's uh, eye-catching is there's a pattern to the salinity pattern uh, that sort of tracks with the ice. And the uh, same sort of thing for the for the temperature in the lower set of panels. And these, uh, these kind of basically uh, are the foundation for, for one of the main conclusions of, of the uh, oceanographic part. So here are some, some example findings uh, and related to what I just said, the, the summer ocean features and the physics are pretty can be pretty nicely described uh, by ensemble averages uh, that are fixed relative to the ice edge. So if we work, if we work um, in a coordinate system that's registered with the ice edge position, we pretty much see the same uh, basic pattern all through the summer. It's a it's the pattern due to the fact that you've got ice melting and disappearing. Uh, over one side of this registered to the ice edge space and uh, ice still existing on the other makes a pretty strong uh, pattern that uh, really overcomes a lot of a lot of the details that we might otherwise uh, think were important. Uh, we also find that the upper ocean changes can be represented pretty well by a simple 1D uh, Arctic price weller pinkle mixing model. We've found uh, that the, now this gets into uh, also looking at remote sensing data and looking at altimetry derived dynamic ocean topography so that we can estimate the surface geostrophic current. And when we look at that, we find that the Beaufort gyre is, is stabilized by in, uh, sort of a feedback between internal ice stress and, and Ekman pumping. And what this means is that if, uh, if Ekman pumping occurs and we pump up the gyre, the ice will go faster and faster, but then as soon as the wind slacks off, uh, there's enough drag on the ice, uh, even in today's conditions, to slow it down. And now at that point, the ocean has already been spun up and it just keeps going. So you get to a place where the ice is actually driven not by the atmosphere, but it's driven by the ocean. And that reverses the Ekman pumping and, and basically puts a negative feedback on the amount that you can spin up the gyre. Uh, the other thing we found was that uh, if we went to the same spot, say 72 north, which on 150 west, Typically that will be ice covered uh, for the first part of the, the season. And then it'll be completely ice free for most of the rest of the summer. And if we look at AXCP shear profiles, uh, we find that basically they don't change. And the, the, uh, the mixing and internal wave energy 
don't really drop off with the loss of the ice. And uh, John Guthrie uh, did a modeling study and trying to explain why the internal wave energy is so low if, if it's not because of ice. And the conclusion is it's basically because uh, of the beta effect. There's not, there's not enough beta to uh, force internal wave energy deeper. The other big factor is the high stratification of, uh, of the Arctic. Uh, as far as the atmosphere, a uh, couple of things. Uh, we find a very strong summer temperature inversions over the sea ice it's quite often. Uh, we find uh, warm air advection events uh, from Alaska over the Arctic Ocean play a significant role in the melt onset. And, uh, and Axel and Zheng Lu have found that strong inversions linked to surface type assignment errors in numerical models. So, so it's uh, these things uh, that they've been measuring with the dropsons are really kind of the, they're rare measurements. And uh, so they can expose a lot of interesting phenomena that we wouldn't otherwise see. And this, uh, this is kind of a lead in to other work that we've been doing uh, with NASA and ONR funded work, uh, looking at the analysis of historical dynamic heights from hydrography from the US Russian Atlas and then modern satellite altimetry uh, derivations of dynamic ocean topography. And when we look at that, uh, they show that the, the kind of the center of action of circulation, the first EOF of dynamic ocean topography, for example, um, is, a, is kind of a low pressure or low height that's centered over the Makarov Basin. So that's over on the Russian side. Um, and unfortunately, uh, due to rem remoteness of that uh, center of action, there's virtually no modern in situ observations there. And so I guess I'm thinking that there's, there's two ways we can look at that. And one is with remote sensing, but if we want to make in situ observations, we have to have a, a way to get out a long distance from basically any Western uh, port. And uh, I think that the scissors approach is a, is a viable way to do that. Uh, we've planned a, a flight for this summer in which instead of going just on 150, we'll fly out uh, across the uh, Russian side of the Arctic Ocean and cross the, the uh, Makarov Basin. And that, that flight uh, is a, a feasible one with the aircraft that they have at Kodiak and it would be the first uh, hydrographic section measurements across that region uh, since the 1993 cruise of the Pargo. And this, this, uh, this discussion is based on this recent paper we have on this, the cyclonic mode of which uh, Cecilia is one of the co-authors. Anyway, so and I just like to thank everybody for uh, our sponsors, ONR and NASA for for uh, supporting this work. And I'd really like to thank the uh, people at Coast Guard Station Kodiak uh, because they really uh, go above and beyond to, uh, to support these missions. And that's everything. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jamie, uh, for interesting presentation. Uh, there any questions for Jamie, please speak up. And uh, while people are thinking, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that uh, modern in situ observations are almost absent in the central Arctic. Um, can, can autonomous uh, instruments fill this gap? What, what do you think? Well, you know, it's a, uh, for example, we, we always um, have trouble keeping, keeping uh, buoys or getting buoys into that area and uh, keeping them there. Mm -hmm. Things tend to uh, accumulate. So if you have surface drifters, they tend to accumulate in anti-cyclonic circulation and, uh, and they tend to disperse from cyclonic circulation. And so that center of action, especially now has, has 
it's tended to have this uh, cyclonic circulation around it. And uh, so not only is it remote in the first place, but the chances of getting buoys into that region are really, really, well, it's really difficult. And uh, it's really difficult to have them stay there. Um, so clearly one thing we want to drop uh, from these aircraft are more, more buoys. And one solution to that uh, lack of uh, collection by the ice is, uh, is to just drop more, more probes. And so hopefully if we can get out and, and do more of these aircraft type drops of up tempo and hopefully other kinds of buoys, uh, Alamo floats, um, then we can get more autonomous measurements over on the Russian side of the Arctic. Okay, yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Um, <clears throat> Sandy's got one in the in the chat. I think she's on the phone. So um, and given that it's a it's an observational type question, um, I hope she won't mind if I read it. Um, Please go ahead. All, all great talks. Thank you. I, I would agree. Those were all uh, really great talks, and we should team up with the post team more often. Um, curious to under that's my ad libbing, by the way. That's not Sandy. Um, curious to understand what the persistent observing gaps are, and how to optimally blend the moored ship-based and air deployed sensors to capture the whole, especially monitoring, understanding these emerging conditions. So anybody can take that or all three of you can take it. Well, I, th I think uh, again, repeating the answer to Dimitri's question, I, I think the aircraft can certainly contribute to Putting out, uh, putting out buoys uh, and making repeat sections, and uh, and we try to. Uh, I think our scissors one fifty line is meant to go over uh, moorings of the Beaufort Gyre exploration project. So, I guess I I kind of think of that as a mix of, of uh, Eulerian and Lagrangian and uh, repeat station sorts of measurements that we can try and make uh, coincident. Uh, I think we need to wrap up. Uh, it's, um, it's been one and a half hour, hours already. Almost. Uh, I would like to thank all our presenters again. Thank you very much. It was very interesting uh, talks. Um, if any one of the teams uh, have any updates or announcement, please uh, speak up. Um, uh, Wilbert, Eugene, uh, William, do you have anything to add? No, just thanking the, the speakers for their wonderful presentations. I would think this was one of the the highlights so far of the of the, the post um, tenure, basically, of our. So I'm very proud and very happy also with this collaboration with the Arctic Observing um, the, the sub team. Yeah, really, I agree. Really, I, I appreciate all the talks, and I think it was one of our highlights too. So thank, thanks to all of you. I, I agree. Yeah, really exciting. The observation very cool analysis. Yeah, it's really exciting results. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right, with this, uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we haven't made uh, any decisions yet about our uh, next meeting, uh, but we'll let you know. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And stay safe and happy, and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Goodbye. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.